Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am very happy to today uh, to share the Zazen and Dharma talk with people in Minneapolis and probably somewhere else, and also uh, in Bloomington. Uh, when Tim San uh, invited me to give a talk today, he in his email, he wrote that MZMC uh, will celebrate the 50th anniversary next year. Uh, when I read it, I was kind of surprised, you know, as uh, uh, introduced, I practiced at MZMC from 1990 three to 1996 as a head teacher and another year as a part-time uh, part teacher. Uh, I remembered uh, in 1970, 93 or 94, we had a celebration for 20th anniversary of MZMC. You know, it was surprising to me, you know. After then, there are, you know, about more, almost 30 years have passed. Uh, it's almost like a previous lifetime. But I also remembered I first met Katagi Roshi in 50 years ago, in 1972, right before Katagi Roshi and his family moved from California to uh, Minneapolis, they returned to Japan. And one day they visited Antaiji. In that, that time, 1972, I just graduated from the university and just started to practice at Antaiji. So I was 23 or four. Uh, and while uh, Katagi Roshi and Tomoe-san uh, talked with Uchiyama Roshi. Uh, a few young monks within, uh, including me, had kind of prayed with the boys. Uh, that was already 50 years ago. Uh, you know, now I'm 73, you know, I'm 10 years older than when Katagi Roshi passed away. I, I, don't, I don't believe, you know, this, you know, passage of time. Uh, but anyway, I'm really, I have, I also, my wife, Yuko, had a connection with MZMC. 
uh, when uh, I think early 80s, she stayed uh, one of Katagi Roshi's students in Minneapolis and practiced with Roshi. And that was kind of a connection I met her. Uh, so uh, there are many things, you know, uh, in my memory, the connection between me and my practice and Katagi Yoshi and uh, uh, Nesota the Meditation Center and also Katagi Yoshi's disciples. Uh, you know, while I stayed at uh, Minneapolis uh, on Sunday mornings, I gave Dharma talks on the uh, verses and sutras in the sutra book for three years. And that, that talk, uh, the collection of the talks became uh, the book Living by Vow. And also I studied, I learned many things about uh, Zen in America. So without the, my experience at MZMC for four years, uh, it was it might be really difficult for me to teach in this country. So I really appreciate this connection. So I'm happy today uh, to share the Dharma with people from MZMC. Now I'm talking to my to my face. It's kind of strange things. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, today I'd like to talk about Ryokan uh, because, uh, you know, Sanshinji has a Dogen Institute uh, and uh, Dogen Institute publish, uh, have published a few books and we will have a new book on Ryokan. Uh, I thought probably I could show the real book today but it takes a little more time. Uh, so I only show the copy of the uh, cover of the uh, book. Uh, it's a beautiful artwork by uh, Tomon, the Dharma heir of Tom, Tonen Okana, uh, the pre former head teacher of Milwaukee Zen Center. Anyway, the title of this book is uh, Ryokan Interpreted. And uh, this uh, is based on my talk. I think I gave a talk on Ryokan's books, I mean Ryokan's poems at MZMC. But uh, after, moving, after moving to California, I <clears throat> uh, gave some talks on Ryokan's poems at Berkeley Zen Center and my talks were uh, recorded and someone transcribed. And uh, Tonan Okana uh, edited, and uh, Tonan and Hoko Kanegis visited Japan a few years ago. And Tonan uh, wrote uh, an intro introductory essay on Ryokan. And uh, there is uh, there are eight chapters, eight uh, categories of Ryokan's poems. Of course, I can talk only one poem this morning. Uh, and I'd like to talk a poem where probably better to briefly introduce Ryokan's uh, life. Ryokan, uh, was a Soto Zen monk. Uh, he is famous uh, as a calligrapher and a poet uh, in Japan. And some of the uh, some of his poems uh, were translated into English. So Soto Zen practitioners and who pe American people who likes uh, Japanese poetry may familiar with this name Ryokan, and he is also a Soto Zen monk. <clears throat> he died in 
he was born uh, 1758. So he uh, was born second half of 18th century. Uh, he was from a very uh, prestigious family in that area. He is from uh, today Niigata Niigata Prefecture. In the ancient time, this area was called Echigo. Uh, and he, his family had for many generations, his family was a town chief of the important port uh, faced on Japan Sea. Uh, because Ryokan was the first oldest son, he supposed to take over the family business. And he did, he tried to do for one, probably less than one year, but uh, he I think he didn't like that job, so he escaped, escaped from a uh, uh, Soto Den temple. When he was seven, uh, that was 1979, when he was, uh, I'm sorry, 75, when he was 17 years old, he escaped from the family business and became a monk. And 1979, uh, after a few years, uh, he met with a, a great, uh, famous Zen master whose name was uh, Dai Ning Kokusen. He was the abbot of a, a monastery in Okayama Prefecture. Uh, first part of this, the master's name, Dining, is the same name with Katagiroshi. Anyway, uh, he practiced uh, with this teacher until 91. So he practiced at the monastery more than 10 years. So he, he became, uh, uh, you know, a uh, good monk. But somehow, when his teacher passed away, he left the monastery. Again, he escaped. He escaped from his family, and he escaped from his monastery. And uh, for several years, we don't know where he was. But in 1996, uh, Ryokan was 38 years old somehow he returned to his hometown, but he never lived in a Buddhist temple. But he lived in a, a small hut hermitage in a mountain called Koku, uh, Kokujozan or Mount Kugami. On the top of that mountain, there was a, I think, oldest, uh, Shingon Shu temple in that area. And there was a tiny hut named Gogoan. Go means five, and Go means a cup, five cups. That means uh, this hut originally was built for a retired, uh, retired uh, abbot of that big temple and that retired abbot received uh, five cups of rice every day that was how this uh, name was called gogoan you know five cups of rice is enough for one person to eat of course uh, uh, five cups, cups of rice is rice is not necessarily mean for food but Rice is a basis of Japanese economy. So uh, the person can change the rice uh, with money. So he uh, receiving five cups of rice a day, uh, he, the retired abbot could live. Uh, 
but uh, when uh, Ryo Kan returned, uh, somehow, you know, no one lived in this hermitage, so uh, the temple allowed Ryo Kan to live. And, and uh, he lived that small hermitage uh, for all, about 20 years until uh, uh, 1816. Uh, Ryokan was 58, so he lived in that hermitage, probably not always. Uh, it is said one time uh, the retired abbot of that temple need to live there. So Ryokan had left. And so for a few years, he left and lived somewhere else. But after this, about this, this retired abbot died, passed away, you know, the temple uh, invited Ryokan again to continue to live there. So all together, about 20 years, he lived uh, in this Gogoan. And uh, when he was so, and he, when he was fifty-eight, uh, it might be too difficult for uh, old. When he was fifty-eight, to you know, walking back and forth from the uh, hermitage in the mountain and the village, so uh, he moved. Uh, lower place, there was a Shinto shrine called Otogo Jinja. And uh, there was, uh, <clears throat> sm again, small house there. Uh, so Ryokan lived there about 10 years until he was 68. Then uh, it was all became too difficult for Ryokan to live there by himself. So he again moved to uh, one family's uh, house and lived uh, several more years until 1831. Uh, when he was 73, he passed away. So after he completed monk training, monk's training, he escaped from the monastery and lived in this hermitage and a small house and lay person's house. So he never uh, <clears throat> taught and he never uh, worked as a temple priest. Uh, he became famous because of his calligraphy and beautiful poems. Uh, among the people in that area. So mainly he was, Ryokan was known as a poet and a calligrapher. Uh, not many people think he was a Zen monk. Anyway, uh, while he stayed at Gogoan, uh, even though he was allowed to live there, uh, you know, the temple didn't give him, provided him five cups of, five cups of life, rice. So uh, to support his life, uh, he did takuhatsu, takuhatsu is begging. So main, his main practice is begging. He walked uh, the villages and towns near there in the daytime and return to the uh, hermitage, Gogoan, in the evening. And uh, in the evening and night, he sat, he practiced Zazen and uh, made calligraphy or light poetry. That, that was basically his uh, practice. Uh, I'd like I'd like to introduce one poem, probably written during the time he lived in that way at Gogowan. Uh, this, po this poem is from uh, 
chapter four of in this book, Ryokan Interpreted. The title of this chapter is One Robe and One Ball. One robe means one robe, okesa, and one robe uh, he used for begging. You know, the practice of begging or takuhatsu in Japanese is as old as the history of uh, Buddhism in India. From the time of Shakyamuni, monks uh, was prohi prohibited to do any work. So after they became monks, they only had one bowl, uh, not one robe, but three robes, uh, at least three robes. Three robes and, and one bowl uh, are the things monks could uh, own. And Buddhist monks, even today in South, Southeast Asian Buddhist countries, they, be, they do takuhats every day. That is how they practiced, they con, uh, support their practices. And in a sense, Ryokan uh, transmitted that kind of practice. So in a sense that even though he didn't live in a Buddhist temple in, Jap in Japan, but his practice was kind of authentic, traditional practice from the time of Shakyamuni. So he practiced, but uh, in Japan, usually, uh, when monks did takuhats, some people donate the rice or other things, but use some. Uh, but many people make a monetary donation, give money. Uh, that is how uh, Ryokan supported his practice, and this poem is about that kind of life. Uh, the first poem I introduced in this chapter, uh, uh, can wrote about uh, Takuhatsu begging practice. And this poem is, uh, uh, is about when he finished uh, begging uh, in the village and returned to uh, Gogoan. And uh, in the night, he had uh, Kind of free time to sit or to write poetry or to make calligraphies. So this poem is uh, about uh, between time, one time between day uh, daytime practice, daytime life, and nighttime life. Uh, let me read this poem. <clears throat> Uh, finished with begging in a desolate village. I return to my hermitage, Gogoan, with its mossy green rock. As the evening sun set behind the western ridge, the pale moon, the pale moon is reflected in the stream before my hut. I wash I washed my feet and ascend the rock, burn incense and sit peacefully in the Zen. Also a child of the Sangha, how can I spend the passing years in vain? Uh, I don't think there's nothing, uh, there's nothing difficult to understand. This is very simple and straightforward and beautiful description of how, what he does after he returning uh, to Gogoan and do that was sitting. Let me read this poem again. Uh, finished with begging in a desolate village. I return to my hermitage with its mossy green rock as 
the evening sun sets behind the western ridge. The pale moon is reflected in the stream before my hut. I wash my feet and ascend the rock, burn incense and sit peacefully in the Zen. Also a child of the Sangha, how can I spend the passing years in vain? This is uh, one of my family, uh, favorite poems by Ryokan, because I had the same experience with Ryokan. You know, after I returned to Japan, to Kyoto from Massachusetts, that was 1981, for three years, I lived in a small uh, non-temple in Kyoto city. Uh, I was a caretaker, but the temple had no uh, family members. So the temple basically had no income. Before that, uh, for many years, many generations, a nun, woman, female monk, uh, lived there. And, and many of Japanese female monk uh, taught something like tea ceremony or friend flower arrangement. That was how uh, they, con they support their practice. But uh, I think there was a very old uh, nun. I think her disciples, she, she had some disciples, but her disciples uh, died before her. So uh, she couldn't maintain the temple. So one of my friends took over the temple and, and take to care this old uh, aged nun at his own temple. So this was empty. And so uh, my friend uh, needs someone to take care of that uh, temple. And uh, uh, he allowed me to live there uh, as a caretaker. So the temple had no uh, regular income. So I decided to support my practice uh, by begging, by takuhats. I did takuhats in Kyoto, in the city of Kyoto, Osaka, and Kobe. Those are the big cities. Uh, during that time, uh, I returned uh, to Japan from Massachusetts because I had a physical problem. I had a pain many places. Uh, so I couldn't uh, sit so much as I did before, and I couldn't uh, work. So I decided to, not I decided, but Uchiyamuroshi encouraged me to work on translation. So I did Zazen by my, basically by myself uh, during the uh, weekdays. And uh, once, uh, once a month, we had a five-day session with uh, Tom Wright, who was the co-translator. I worked with him. Uh, so beside, during, beside the session, uh, I lived basically alone and to support my practice and uh, translation work. I did takuhats uh, a few times a month. Uh, that was enough to simply uh, keep me alive. I, dis I think I received about uh, in that, uh, two to three hundred dollars, and that was enough to buy food and to, I think, to buy, to pay the telephone bill. And so uh, my life was very simple. So uh, I, had, I did the same thing after doing takuats uh, in the cities. I returned to this small temple where I lived alone. And the first thing we had to do after returning to the temple uh, was washing my feet. 
because when we do the cards, we uh, wear a, a straw sandal with bare feet. So uh, after the cards, uh, my feet were dirty. So first thing, even before uh, enter the house, enter the building was washing my feet and uh, take a rest and I did the cut. So I, I mean, I sat by myself. So I did exactly the same thing, even though I didn't sit outside like Ryokan because outside it was in the city. So the scenery is not so quiet and beautiful like where Ryokan lived. So I sat, sat in the temple, uh, but this is what uh, I exactly the same thing I did during those three years. That was why I really, really like this poem. So he said uh, he, after finishing takuhatsu or begging in a desolate village, he lived in the countryside. Uh, so the villages were not so, you know, uh, rich. So probably he didn't receive much donation. So, he, but somehow he lived in that way. And uh, he said, I returned to my hermitage, Gogo One, with his moss, with it mossy green rock. Uh, Hoko visited Gogo Wan, so, uh, but I'm not sure, I, I never been there, so uh, I'm not sure if Ryokan really had a mossy green rock or not, but somehow there must be some rock nearby his uh, Gogo Wan. So sometimes he, he washed his feet probably on the uh, stream and the log might be by the stream and uh, he sat on that rock. Might be a beautiful time, you know. And the next third line he said, as the evening sun uh, set behind the western ridge, so the sun is already set behind the western ridge. So, uh, it was a twilight time. And pale moon, the white moon, is reflected in the stream. So this is the time between daytime and nighttime. And it's really a beautiful moment, you know, because, uh, in, uh, you know, the entire sky was reflected and become uh, many different colors. And the white moon was reflected, but moon is not uh, <clears throat> so bright yet because it's still bright. That was, I think, one of the most beautiful time of the day. And probably this is uh, during the summer. In the winter, uh, where Ryokan lived, they had a lot of snow. Sometimes they had 10 feet of snow. So he couldn't do tako, even takuhats. So this might be a beautiful time of the year and one of the beautiful uh, time of the day. This is where he practiced the Zen. So this is the scenery of when he sat on the rock. So he said, I washed, I wash my feet and ascend, climb up the top of the rock and burn incense and sit peacefully in the Zen. So this is what he did. Uh, so he described a beautiful scenery of twilight where he sat, but I don't think uh, this is simply the description of, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 
That's okay. Uh, I think you are familiar with, with this uh, expression, echo hensho. Uh, echo hen show. Uh, maybe you don't know this uh, Japanese or Chinese expression, but uh, this is the expression Dogen Zenji used in Fukanza Zengi. Uh, in English, uh, I think in my English translation of Fukanza Zengi, I translate this as turn, turn the light inward and illuminate the self. The original uh, expression of this uh, turning the light inward and illuminate the self is Echo Hensho. Uh, A is Tan and Ko is light and Hen is return and Sho is illuminate. So turn the light and return the illumination. So there's no self in original Ex, uh, expression echo hensho. So self is a kind of uh, interpretation. And in the case of Zazen, uh, to translate this expression as turn the light inward and illuminate the self is a light uh, interpretation. Usually we go out, we, we you know, our light go outside and illuminate this thing and try to understand what this is, whether this is good thing or not good thing or bad thing, or is this variable or not variable, or I like this or not like this. So our light go outside and illuminate uh, the object and try to think. So there is a interaction between self and the object. Uh, but uh, in the Zen, there's no object. When we sit facing the wall, even though we keep our eyes open, you know, the wall is not the object. So there's no object. So we turn the light inward and we illuminate ourselves in the Zen. That is uh, the translation of this expression, echo can show. But originally, this Chinese expression, echo can show, is that uh, description of the scenery when Yokan sat. You know, the sun is already set, but uh, the sun uh, turn its light and illuminate the entire uh, sky and the mountains. Uh, so sun is already set, but uh, the already set sun uh, illuminate uh, this entire world, you know, skies and mountains and everything. And that, and that was the most beautiful time of the day. That is basically what this expression means, echo hensho. So the sign is already gone, set, and it, it's, we cannot see the sun anymore. This is kind of important point, but uh, the light of the sun illuminate the entire world and it become really bright and beautiful. And uh, this is, the, I think this is Fat Dogen, I'm, I'm sorry, Yokan wrote in this poem as, uh, 
as the evening sun set behind the western ridge, the pale moon is reflected in the stream before my heart. He described you know, the scenery of Echo Henshaw. And this is not uh, <clears throat> simply the description of the scenery, the, the world in which Ryoka is sitting. But this is also a description of his Zazen. Uh, he wrote uh, many poetry, many, many poems about his Zazen. And it seems he, he talks about where and when uh, he sat. But those descriptions uh, of the scenery or circumstance he sat is also the scenery of his Zazen. So in this case, you know, by, ex by express the scenery about sun is already set and moon is reflected on the stream. He, he described his Zazen. That means our Zazen is also uh, between uh, daytime and night. That means during daytime, we have to work. We have to think. We have to do so many things. And in order to uh, do something, we have to make a distinction or discrimination. And we have to think what is good and what is bad. Or what I should do, what is more important or less important. And uh, during daytime, when Ryokan did takuhat, he had to think. Uh, in my experience, you know, uh, when my takuhat was not uh, the same with Ryokan. Ryokan practiced takuhat in the villages, but I did practice in the cities, special, basically the marketplaces. So it's very busy. So many people are you know, coming and going. And we stand each in front of each and every shop. And we just hold uh, the oryoki, uh, oryoki bowl like this in front of our uh, face, level of my, our nose. And we wear a big bamboo hat. So I couldn't, I couldn't really see the entire world. I could only see in front of me. So it, I must be really careful and allowed not to disturb others. You know, uh, we should not disturb the people in the shop and we, sh I, we should not disturb the customers who are doing shopping at the shop. At the shop, and also there are many people who are walking on the street. And you know, I was a beggar, so I had no uh, right to say now I am doing this. Don't disturb me. But I have to be careful not disturb others. Uh, and also, we should not walk on the same uh, street again or stand in front of the same shop again. So I need to be very uh, alert. We are, you know, I did Takahat already. You know, many of the marketplace in Japan are very, you know, thousands of small shops and <clears throat> the marketplace is like a like a what do they call mail maze <laughs> so if i uh, if i was careless you know i go on the same street again and then people scold me <laughs> shouted against me so i have to think and be careful always while I was walking. Uh, 
but after I return from Takahats in a small quiet temple, uh, now I can rest. My I don't need to work. Uh, my mind can be you know rest. So this is really uh, different. And when I thought, you know, I was released from this, you know, continuous, you know, thinking and making decision and being alert. But uh, during this time between uh, daytime and night, uh, you know, during night, you know, we can simply rest and we don't think, especially, uh, you know, the time of Ryokan. Uh, you know, they didn't have electricity. Uh, even they, he wanted to read books or write poetry. He only had a, a candle or oil lamp. It was not really bright and those are expensive. So uh, during the night, it was completely dark. So uh, there's no discrimination possible. So between uh, daytime, when we have to make discrimination and during uh, nighttime when we sleep in the dark and without discrimination, our Zazen is kind of a, a boundary between these, uh, you know, discrimination and non-discrimination or thinking and not thinking. I think that is what Dogen uh, Zenji wrote in Fukanza Zengi, think of not thinking. How do you think of not thinking beyond thinking? So when in our Zazen, uh, thoughts are coming and going. We don't think, we let go or opening the hand of thought yet thoughts are coming and going, but we, we don't grasp them, or we don't fight against them, or we don't chase after them, but just uh, let them come and let them go. Like the sound uh, of bad thinking when, while we are sitting, uh, we don't think bad thinking is an uh, object of our yeah, consciousness. So birds are singing there, but I'm sitting here. You know, during the Zen, uh, there's no uh, object outside of ourselves, but while we are sitting too often, our thought become the object and we start to interact. When we are interacting uh, with thought coming and going, then our mind uh, is divided into two part, the thought coming and going and the person sitting that is uh, observing the thought. And uh, often we think I like this idea or I, he, this is really a good memory to me. When we do such a thing, we are thinking. When we are thinking, there's an interaction between person sitting and uh, those thoughts coming and going. And when we found we do such a thing, we return to just sitting. This is opening the hand of thought or the thing of thought. So thoughts are there, but those thoughts are not object of our, uh, you know, uh, the six of a six sense organ is our mind, mind and the object of mind. If there is a separation, then we are thinking. But when we open our hand, those are there, and yet they are not object. Uh, this is really important uh, point of our dozen practice. So our dozen practice is not a method to eliminate or kill those thoughts and make uh, our mind uh, blank. But thoughts are coming and going but we don't think. So this is really a boundary between thinking and not thinking, or discrimination and not discrimination. 
thought is there, but we don't think. Uh, this is what uh, Dogen Zenji mentioned means this, with this expression, uh, turn the light inward and illuminate the self. But if we think uh, the person who is illuminated and the self which is illuminated are two, then that is not the uh, You know, the light is there and we are just sitting and with this uh, beautiful scenery, thoughts are just coming and going. That is what I think I believe, that is what Dogen meant when he said, think of not thinking. How do you think of not thinking beyond thinking? So this uh, expression of uh, the scenery of the sun already set and moon is reflected in the street, in the water, is actually expression of the nature of Dogen's and also Ryokan's Zazen practice. Uh, it's already 12, almost 12, so I stop uh, talking here. Uh, if you read more, please read this book. Uh, Ryokan Interpreted. Uh, this book is uh, <clears throat> my uh, talk about Ryokan's poems and also, as I said, Tone uh, Nokona uh, wrote e uh, introductory essays and uh, Hoko went to Japan with Tone uh, and took so many photos, beautiful photos uh, of the Ryokan's country. And uh, in this book, there are many such uh, beautiful uh, photos. So I think you can enjoy uh, Ryokan's poem. Maybe you are not so much enjoy my talk, but Ryokan's poem and uh, photograph photos by Hoko and uh, Tonen's essays and uh, Tomon's uh, really wonderful artwork. Uh, that is what I have to say this morning. Is there any question or comment? Uh, do, we, do we have time for question and answer? If so, please. We have a question at Zen Center. Thank you, Okamara Roshi, for your talk. Thank you. I especially liked when you talked about Takahatsu in, mm -hmm. in Japan, in big cities in the 1980s. Um, mm -hmm. I, my question for you is, how, 40 years later, how do you think about that practice? How does that influence how has that influenced your practice um, of depending on generosity for your livelihood from others? That's a very important and meaningful practice. Uh, probably we could say as meaningful as our Zazen practice. You know, Takuhatsu is basically the practice of dana, dana paramita. Uh, you know, dana is first of the uh, six parameters. And, uh, you know, when we practice Zazen, uh, we see the emptiness of all beings, uh, including ourselves. So we see, you know, these five skandhas are empty. That is what uh, the first sentence of the Heart Sutra is saying. And seeing, by seeing the emptiness of our, this five aggregate, we become uh, free from 
uh, grasping or attachment to our self, self-attachment. And another important uh, part of our practice is to see the, by seeing the emptiness, uh, we need to see the connection with others. When we think this is really uh, independent beings, then uh, you know it's kind of difficult to see the in, uh, interconnectedness. But by seeing uh, uh, emptiness, we start to see the interconnectedness, interconnectedness with others. Without relation with others, there's no such thing as me. No, now I think I am a Japan, Japanese because I am not an American. By seeing American people, or uh, by seeing uh, any people who are not Japanese, I see I I am a Japanese. But before I before I started to understand, uh, there are uh, other people who are not Japanese. When I was a kid, I didn't see, I didn't understand I was a Japanese. So this uh, interconnectedness is uh, seeing the impact in interconnectedness after seeing the uh, emptiness of five scandals, I think is really important part of our practice and studying Dharma in Mahayana Buddhism. And by <coughs> doing takuhats, you know, while we takuhats, you know, is, in a sense, very difficult to practice. You know, uh, in the winter, you know, because we walk with bare feet with a straw sandal, it's very cold. And also the hand, we hold the audio keyboards like this without gloves. So uh, hands and feet are very cold. And in, in the summer, you know, we, we, we have to wear three or four layers of robes. It's really hot, especially in Japanese hot and humid summer. So uh, whether in the winter or summer, it's really difficult. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, during uh, doing takuhats, we just are holding the empty bowl. We have to nothing to offer to exchange with uh, people donation. Uh, it's like uh, we are empty. But somehow uh, by walking, wearing these robes and straw sandals and bamboo hat, uh, somehow people make donation. Without you know, all those people didn't know who I are, who I was. So the people had a kind of a trust uh, for trust with this kind of a, a costume or a, because you know the tradition from Shakyamuni Buddha you know for more than uh, 2000 years what you know all Buddhist monks in many different traditions did. And uh, Taku has one of the practices Buddhist monks have been doing because this practice was transmitted and all those uh, Buddhist monks in the history made some contribution to the society. So people in that society had trust even though they don't know particular this particular person, but somehow they trust this tradition. So they made even though a small donation uh, into this empty bowl. So I found they make the donation not because I am important, but because they trust this tradition. So uh, I felt during Takuats, I felt I should not use this donation for my personal sake to uh, fulfill my personal desire. We have to 
use this donation for the for Dharma. Uh, that was really uh, actual teaching more than you know reading books. Uh, it's really uh, how can I say direct knowledge. This is not for me, but this is for the Dharma. So I have to use my body and mind being supported by the donations. I have to use this body and mind for the sake of the Dharma. Uh, it was really <clears throat> a deep and direct and uh, very concrete teaching. So, uh, you know, although I, uh, we did Takuhatsu fairly while I was practicing at Antaiji, but during staying, practicing at Antaiji, you know, several monks did Takuhatsu together. So I didn't think uh, so seriously about the meaning of Takuhatsu. It was like a, a hiking. You know, rest of the month, rest of the time, we just stay in the temple and practice Dazen or study Dharma, studying Buddhism. But uh, it was kind of a fun to walk outside with monks. So I never think about the deep meaning of Takatsu. But during that three years, I did Takatsu by myself. I really study, studied the deep meaning of this practice. Uh, so uh, to ans answer your question, this was really important experience to me. Okay. Yoshi. Um, my apologies, we'll have to stop here. So that we have, my apologies, we will have to stop here. So we have time for announcements. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for listening. I hope we can share the Dharma again. Yes. And you have closing vows? Okay. Yes. <laughs>